Today, I thought for the message, I would do something a little different that we've not done in a couple years, but we're going to look at the story in the Old Testament of a very well-known mom, but not as a way of just being a message today for moms on Mother's Day. I thought we're going to look at the story of a true story of a lady in the Old Testament and what all of us learn through the life and story of this particular mom, because her story applies to all of us. The things she experienced applies to to all of us. We can learn from all that she did and all that happened to her. And it's looking today in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1 at the story of a lady named Hannah. Uh, in fact, it's a, quite often a very frequent Mother's Day message scripture that's used. But again, we're looking at it today not from the, just from what you learn as a mom, but what from all of us learn from the life of this particular mom. This is a true story out of the Old Testament. Um, It's a fairly long story, so we're not going to read all of it. Uh, Instead, I'm going to summarize kind of the story, and then we're going to look at a few key points in scriptures within the story. So here's, here's the gist of the story. A man had two wives, which I know sounds like the beginning of a really bad joke, right? A man had two wives, which does tell you something about him. He was not a very smart man, all right? Uh, 20, almost 28 years I've been married, and... I'm smarter than that. Anyway, uh, we'll leave that um, alone. But in the Old Testament, polygamy was pretty common in most of the cultures of the Old Testament. Many men had multiple wives. It's not the way God designed it, not the way that he wanted it, but people did it anyway, right? Unlike today, where we always do everything exactly the way God wants us to do it. Back then, they ignored God. Yeah, you saw just a little sarcasm in that statement right there, just a tad. But this man, his name was Elkanah, and he had two wives. One was uh, Penina, and the other was Hannah. And the first wife, Penina, uh, it says that she had many children, but for whatever reason, her husband did not love her as much. And his other wife, Hannah, had no children, but he loved her with all of his heart. And so, as you can imagine, there was a strain in their relationship, just a little, as (laughs) you probably guessed that there would be. Um, But one of the reasons they had such great strain in their relationship is Penina took great delight in ridiculing and taunting and harassing and making fun of Hannah for the fact that she was barren and had no children. And Hannah felt very broken in her spirit about it and about not having to have children and especially the relationship that they had. And finally, Hannah, in the middle of her pain, she breaks down uh, before God and she pours her heart out to God. And when she does this, she's actually sitting on the steps of the temple. And she's pouring her heart out so deeply to God that at one point her lips are moving, but nothing's coming out of her mouth. In fact, to the point, the priest, a priest named Eli, comes by and sees her, assumes she's drunk and kind of schools her about it, all right? And she's kind of, literally, it's what it says. And she has to make the case that's not what's going on here. In fact, here's what she says um, to Eli, the priest, but Hannah answered him, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Now, let's just go ahead and acknowledge this, that unless you've actually been here, it's very almost impossible to fully grasp what this feels like and what this really is. And I know some of you in the room have been there where the only only step you had left, the only thing you had left was literally pouring out your heart to God. Whether it was grief, whether it was confusion, whether it was uh, betrayal, what it, whatever it was. Unless you've been here, you don't quite grasp this. But if you have, you know what she means, that she is pouring all she is out before the Lord, pleading, asking for him to do in her life what only he can do to fix something that she has no ability whatsoever to change. And so Eli, the priest, when she tells him this, that this is what's going on. I haven't been drinking. I haven't had too many mimosas. This is me praying and crying out. I'm hurting before God. Eli, the priest, actually speaks a prayer of blessing over her. It, it encourages Hannah. She leaves and returns home and, and continues living her life and honoring God. And later on, a few verses down, we read this in verse 20. It says, And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked him from the Lord. And so Hannah makes this promise to God that if he'll answer her prayer, um, she'll dedicate this child to the Lord, and she does. She dedicates Samuel to God. She raises him to a certain age until he's old enough and then brings him to the temple, returns him to Eli, that same priest that she met um, all those years back. 
Samuel grows up to be one of the most prominent figures in the nation of Israel in their history. Um, he's the one who anoints Saul as the very first king of Israel. He anoints David as the second king of Israel. Of course, you know, from the genealogy of David comes Christ Jesus himself. It's a very dramatic story in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. You can read it you know, on, on your own later. I would encourage you to do that. But this morning, what I want to do is focus on four statements that are made in this in this chapter, in the first chapter of, of Hannah's story. Four statements that are made, and from those four statements of Scripture, four conclusions we can draw that apply not only to the moms in the room, but apply to all of us in the room and all of us watching online to uh, the events that happen in this particular mom's story. Here's the first statement that I want to dial in on this morning. It says in verse 6 that her rival used to provoke her grievously and irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. What I want to pull out from this is it's interesting the way that it words this, that her rival, that these two ladies, rather than being confidants, rather than being friends, rather than being there to support one another, there was this rivalry between them. And especially on the part of the other woman, she took it upon herself to provoke and to irritate as best she could this other mom to bring her down another, in order to kind of build herself up. And the conclusion I want to draw from this that really applies to all of us, whatever season of life you're in, whatever you do or do not do, however old or young you might be, is the fact is that all of us, every single one of us in this room, have this opportunity. Sometimes we are each other's harshest critics when we could be their greatest encouragers. There's moments on a regular basis in all of our lives when we have the chance to be someone's greatest encourager, but for whatever reason, we choose and decide to be their harshest critic. Human nature is bent toward unhelpful criticism. Would you agree with that? You ever had somebody uninvitedly offer you unhelpful criticism? Recently, I was speaking at an event. It wasn't here. It was somewhere else. And it was like a, I'm not going to go back there to speak for any, I mean, it was just a one time I was there speaking at something. And apparently in the midst of what I was sharing, I got a date wrong. I said, I don't know, like April 7th instead of April 10th. Eighth or something like that, right? And so I finish and it's over. And as it's winding up and I'm leaving, somebody walks up to me and says, Hey, hey, and I shake, reaches a hand out and shakes my hand. And I assume they're going to say something polite or whatever, you know, and I'm, I'm okay. And he says, Hey, I'm sure nobody else will tell you this, but you got the date wrong. I said, I'm sorry. He said, You said April 7th when you should have said April 8th. I mean, you're probably just nervous or something, but I just want you to know you did that. Thank you. And then he says, you know, I thought about being an English teacher, but I, I thought, I, you know what I should have been is like a, an editor, because I always pick up on everybody's mistakes. And I thought, I bet you have a lot of friends, <laughs> right? I mean, we all have this ability to just criticize and point out the flaws in everybody else. And why do we do that, right? You ever thought about, well, what is it? Why, why do we feel the, the ability to do that or the, have the desire to do that? Well, maybe in part because it's a lot easier to feel good about myself when I'm making somebody else feel less. In every opportunity you have to offer someone harsh criticism really isn't all that beneficial. You need to understand that in that moment, what you actually have is the opportunity to instead be their greatest encourager. I realize the situation both of these women were in was not ideal. It's not even the way that God intended it to be. And yet, neither of them understood each other more than the two of them understood each other. And rather than criticizing and making fun of and provoking this other woman, she had the opportunity to be her greatest encourager. Look, I, I will say this, and again, this message isn't directed at moms, but I will say this to the ladies in the room, and especially to the moms in the room. For whatever reason, sometimes, I think we've all witnessed this, for whatever reason, there's something in motherhood that some moms find it easy rather than to encourage other moms to criticize other moms. The way they raise their kids, are raising their kids, did raise their kids, interacting with their grandkids and interacting with their adult kids. And it's not just moms, it's all of us. But ladies, I want to encourage you. There is, there, there is an opportunity you and I have to not discourage, but to encourage. In fact, look at what the Bible goes on to say in the New Testament about this idea. In Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider... So what does this word mean? Consider, give thought to, give intentional thought to what? How to stir up one another. Now, let's just acknowledge culture is really good at stirring up one another. We're great at knowing how to stir up one another, but 
What does it say we're supposed to stir up in Hebrews chapter 10? Let us consider, give thought, how to stir one another up towards two things, towards love and good works. You ever, you ever consider that, that in the morning as a follower of Christ, I am called by God to wake up in the morning, open my eyes and give thought today, how can I stir up the people around me towards the love of God? How can I stir up the people around me towards things that are good and holy and right and encouraging? Because it goes on to say the purpose of stirring up one another towards love and good works has one goal, that we would encourage one another. That we would encourage one another. You and I have the opportunity to be someone else's greatest encourager. And as a Christian, we're called to do it. And so the next time we're, we're considering Criticism, think about how can I encourage them? And that doesn't mean that all critique is bad. We need critique in our life. We don't like it, but we need it every Monday morning, tomorrow morning. A group of us is going to gather and we're going to critique everything that happened in the life of this church for the last seven days. We do that every single Monday. What went right? What went well? What was a great big win? What went wrong? What did we, was broken? Admit, what's, what's not going right that needs to be fixed? Every single week we do that. And I'll be honest with you, most weeks we have more things that went wrong than went right. I mean, not big things, not huge things, but little things. That's helpful criticism. How do we make this better? But even within criticism and how, helping someone get better, how do you stir them up towards love and stir, stir them up towards what is good and encourage them? And so here's the question I would encourage all of us to ask ourselves in regards to this whole thing. Am I? What am I? What, am I usually stirring up? What am I usually stirring up? Am I usually stirring up criticism or am I usually stirring up encouragement? Because whenever I'm tempted just to be critical, I have the opportunity in that moment to be that person's greatest encouragement. We learn that from the story of Hannah. The story of Hannah goes on in this, in this verse, and I, I want to go back to the verse we just read because there's a second part that I think applies to all of us, and it's really one of the more difficult parts of this whole story. Her rival used to provoke Hannah grievously and irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. The Lord closed Hannah's womb. We're not told why. We're not told for how long. We're not told God's rationale or thinking. We're simply told the Lord closed her womb, which, if we're just being honest, is a fairly difficult statement in the story, isn't it? Because we're all led to ask, well, why would God do that? Well, I want to try and answer that question for you, but as I do, I want you to think about this. Here's what you and I learned from this part of the story and why I think it's good that it's included in the story. Because what it teaches you and me is that God's plan for you might not be his plan for me. God's plan for you might not be his plan for me. Karma did not close Hannah's womb. The Lord did. And again, it might sound cruel. To us, it probably sounds harsh and unkind and unloving, but I want to suggest that it's actually good news that the Bible says this for this reason. Here's why it's good news. It's good news because it means that the Lord is involved in all of my life, even in my disappointments. Even in the things that don't go the way that I want them to and prayed that they might or would or could, God is involved not only in my triumphs and successes and blessings, he's also involved in my disappointments. And for me, I don't know about you, but for me, that's good news. That as a follower of Jesus, I'm not just left to chance, even if I don't like God's answer. In 1997, I was trying really hard to move my family, which at the time consisted only of my wife and I. Um, she was pregnant with our daughter, but in, I was trying really hard to move us to Atlanta uh, to start a church. And I wanted to move to Atlanta to start a church for two reasons. First reason is that there's a lot of people in Atlanta and I figured it'd be hard to fail. That's a good reason. And the second reason was probably not any more spiritual because the Atlanta Braves are in Atlanta. <laughs> I figure if I'm in Atlanta, I can see a lot more baseball games of my favorite team than I can living in the Orlando area, right? So I wanted to move to Atlanta primarily for those two reasons. Start a church for those two reasons. A lot of people there, we can do this, we won't fail, and we'll go see a lot of baseball games. Now, God obviously had other plans. 
And you know, the fact is, if I had moved to Atlanta 26 years ago, you know, you know what would have happened? I, I, I'm pretty sure I would have started a church and we would have started a church in Atlanta and it probably would have done fine. I, I believe that God still would have started and orchestrated a new church in Claremont and it probably would have done fine. Might have even done better without me here for the last 26 years. But you know what would not have happened? If I moved to Atlanta 26 years ago, rather than follow the doors in the, what I know God was calling me to do, I would have missed out on some of the most important relationships and experiences in my life that God has used to form me and change me and grow me and mature me and bless me. Wednesday morning, our son got on a plane, flew to Alaska where he's spending the next five months serving with Echo Ranch Bible Camp, our ministry partner in Alaska. If I'd gotten my way 26 years ago, I never would have met Bob and Mary Eamon, who were retired missionaries. You can clap for Bob and Mary. Somebody knows Bob and Mary over here. They were retired missionaries, 40 years plus in Africa, ended in Spain, moved to Claremont, became a part of our church. He was the temporary director, interim director of Echo Ranch Bible Camp. And he invited me up to do a retreat for their staff 14, almost 15 years ago. I thought it was just a one and done. We would go there. But instead, God built a relationship between us and our church and that camp. And we've been going back every year. We'll be up there in July. If I had never met, if I had done what I wanted to do 26 years ago, I never would have met Bob and Mary. We never would have gone to Alaska. My son wouldn't be on a plane and now be uh, in Alaska for the next five months serving in, in ministry in that capacity. Now, that doesn't mean that our life wouldn't be good. I believe it would be good. Anytime you follow God and you're obedient to God and you're trying to honor God with your life, your life's gonna be good, whether I'm living here or I'm living somewhere else. Follow that? At the same time, I would have missed out on some of what God had for me in my life. And I'm telling you, so the people that I've met, the, the, our church family, it's, this is more than a crowd. Those of you that know me know I'm being serious when I say this. This is more than a crowd for me. This is family. I love our church. I love the people in our church, most of them. But Hebrews 11 tells us that sometimes God's plan for one person is not his plan for the next person. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's this long list of what we call these great saints of the faith. Abraham and Moses and Noah and a lot of other people. And in the middle of that chapter, it says this. Some of them enjoyed the best of what God had in mind. They enjoyed God's blessing and favor and things went really well. And others of them never, ever saw and experienced firsthand the fulfillment of God's promise to them. They only saw them from afar and welcomed them from a distance because God had something better in mind. And what that means is, it's the same thing that we learned from Hannah's story. God's plan for you might not be his plan for me. And when I expect and decide in my mind that God's plan for you is exactly what God's plan for me needs to look like, I've set myself up not only for disappointment, but honestly, I've even set myself up for disobedience to God. Because God's not called me to be you or called you to be me. He's called us to follow him. And I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but maybe I, I guarantee you, because I know I've been here more times than I can count, God, why do they get to and why can't I? Well, the reason's simple, because God's plan for them isn't necessarily his plan for me. Third statement I want to look at. In verse 20, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Another statement that's not really easy, but hopefully we can embrace a little bit this morning. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Now, we don't know how long of a time frame this is. If it's a month, a year, 10 years, we don't know. I tend to think it's a decent amount of time because otherwise it would have said, and soon Hannah conceived and bore a son. But that's not what it says. It says in due time, which leads me to believe there's some serious waiting going on in Hannah's life. And I don't know what you do when you're waiting on God. Brian gets impatient. And sometimes Brian has a habit. I know I'm speaking about myself in the third person right now. Brian has this habit of sometimes even taking God's plans and putting them in my hand and trying to work out God's plan for me. Anybody else ever done that or is that just me? It's just me. Great, all right. Uh, there's, some, there's some honest people. The rest of y'all need to repent and be honest. 
But here's the amazing thing about Hannah in her story. As she's in the midst of this in due time, she never quits. She never stops praying. She never stops trusting. She never stops following God. She didn't forget about God when she got what she asked for. Because that's how it often ha happens, right? We're praying for God to do something in our life that only God can do, and it's taking way too long. So sometimes we just get impatient, we get tired, and we, we just quit praying or quit asking or quit in our minds waiting, and we maybe even just quit on God or faith. I mean, I know that's happened to a lot of people. Or we get what we want, and then we quit praying because there's no longer a crisis and we don't have anything to really ask God for, right? Because that's all prayer is for, is to ask God to do things for us. No, by the way, that's another sermon for another time. Hannah never stopped praying. She never quit trusting and waiting on God just because God was taking longer than she thought he should take. And when God did finally answer her prayer, Hannah held true and did exactly what she promised she would do. She committed her child to the Lord. We'll talk about this in a minute. We'll look at it in a second. But Hannah actually gives the Lord, the child that she has prayed for. Now think about that. This thing you have asked and waited and pleaded before God to give you. So praying so deeply in the spirit of God that a priest walks by and thinks you've been drinking too much and doesn't realize you're praying. I mean, crying out to God for his blessing in your life and God finally answers the prayer and gives you what you asked for. And what is the immediate response that Hannah has? She gives it right back. Not normally my response to God, to his answer prayers in my life. It's thank you very much. It's about time. When he's old enough, Hannah returns to the temple. She finds Eli the priest, the same exact priest. And here's what she says to him. I'm the woman who's standing here in your presence. Remember that? When I was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. I'm the woman that was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. And her miracle baby, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, eventually becomes one of the most important spiritual leaders in the nation of Israel, the prophet Samuel. He anoints Saul king. He anoints David king. He leads the nation spiritually. One of the hardest disciplines to develop in the life of any, any believer is the patience of waiting on God's timing. Waiting for something good that only God can do or give and we don't understand why God hasn't done or given it yet. How many parents I've prayed with and watched pray for a child to return to faith? Or pray that God would open up a door for this or for that, and they're good things, and yet God's just not done it yet. One of my favorite scriptures along those lines is from another prophet in the Bible. Jeremiah, if you're familiar with Old Testament history, Jeremiah is the prophet that is basically on duty when all of the warnings to Israel about if you don't repent and follow God, here's what's gonna happen. Please return and repent. And they didn't. And finally it all collapses and all falls apart on Jeremiah's watch as prophet. And Babylon destroys and takes him as prisoners for 70 years and that whole thing. And in the midst of that, Jeremiah prays his lament to God, telling him that I feel, God, like you're not even answering my prayers anymore because of the sins of other people. You aren't listening to me. You shot an arrow in my heart. I can't hear you and all of this. And in the middle of this lament, he has this one statement that is so chock full of meaning and application for you and me. In Lamentations chapter three, Jeremiah says this in the middle of his prayer to God, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good to wait, said no one else ever. And Jeremiah's promises is good. It's good to wait on the salvation of the Lord. Why is it good to wait? You know, there's a story in the New Testament of Jesus interacting with three of his closest friends, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. You know this story? And Lazarus gets sick, and when he gets sick, his sister sends word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick, please come. 
And the Gospel of John records the weirdest detail. It says, when Jesus learned that Lazarus was sick, he waited two more days before he went. And because he waited two more days before he went, Lazarus dies. And everybody's confused. Why did you wait? Why, what, what is all this happening? And Jesus' response to why he waited, again, it's another one of those at surface value. It seems weird and wrong and confusing and mean, but actually it's filled and packed full of grace and love. Here's what Jesus says to them about why he waited. He says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not here so that you would believe. What I'm getting at from the story of Hannah, from the story of Jeremiah, from the story of Jesus and Lazarus, the Bible teaches this and preaches this from beginning to end is that sometimes waiting on God is good. And here's the reason why it's good. It's good because often it's in the waiting that God leads us to believe. Often it's only when we're waiting on God that we're led to believe. And friends, what you need to realize is that God is not as concerned about your comfort and your life being blessed the way you think it should be as he is about your holiness and your soul and your eternal life with him. What God cares more about anything else is your heart. That it would be given and entrusted to him. And oftentimes it's in the middle of waiting on God for something, to do something, to give something, to fix something or change something. That in those moments when we can't do it and we realize only God can, it's in those moments quite often that God knows that is the moment when you are most likely to believe. Often it's in the waiting that God leads us to believe. For Hannah, God closed her womb so that in due time, What does that mean? It means at the right time. God would give her a son that would be more than just a son. He would be Samuel. One of the most prominent and important figures in Israel's history. Now here's the deal, and you got to understand this. Because too often I feel like this passage gets preached this way. Have enough faith, wait long enough, and God will answer that prayer exactly the way you want. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, sometimes the Bible teaches the opposite. As I mentioned, Hebrews 11 said, there's some people that never saw God's promise fulfilled in their lifetime, only welcomed it from a distance. Every situation you and I pray for and trust God for and wait on God for does not end up like this, where God gives you everything you want and you live happily ever after. But the promise we do have in Scripture is even better than that. You know what the promise we have in Scripture is? That God is always at work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Which means if God doesn't answer your prayer and give you what you're waiting on the way you think he should, it means he's got something better in mind. Maybe not easier, it might be harder, but it's better Better for your holiness, better for your righteousness, better for the plan that he has in mind for you because his plan for you might not be his plan for me. Which leads me to the final statement in the story of Hannah and Samuel that I want to point out today. In verse 27, it says this. Hannah says, I prayed and the Lord granted my request. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent or given to the Lord. Here's what Hannah understood that I hope you grasp above anything else I've said this morning. It's this, that nothing matters more in this life than your relationship with God. That's what I want you to pull out of that statement. Nothing in this world and in this life matters more than your relationship with God. There are so many things competing for our time and our attention and the loyalties of our heart. And those things, they can change faster than any of us in this room can keep up with. There's always something else drawing us away from Christ. Always something that wants the allegiance of your heart, the loyalty of your heart. But the fact is, as a man, as a woman, as a child, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a business person, as a retired person, nothing is more important in your life than your relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing at all. Hannah figured out that the ultimate goal of motherhood was not raising a well-balanced child. Was not raising a child that had a lot of friends, that was popular and well-known, could do a lot of great things. What mattered more than anything else was to raise a child whose heart belonged to God. That's what mattered more to her than anything else. So much so that when she finally received the things she'd been longing for and waiting for, she took that gift of her son and gave it right back to God. She prayed that her child would serve God authentically for a lifetime. 
And he did. Now, I want to close by speaking a word directly to the moms in our room and watching online. Because here's, here, here's the fact. Mother's Day is a day that brings a myriad of emotions along with it. I know that. Every, every year when it comes around. For some of you, this is a great day. Life is good. Kids are good. They're healthy. They're making great decisions. All of that, it's a good day. And if that's where you are and that's the season where you're in, receive that as a gift from God. And the Bible even says that as the people of God, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we rejoice with you for the blessings of God in your life. Celebrate that. Thank God for that. And live in his grace. And I know for others, though, today is a harder day. It's a harder day because you miss your mom. Or because you're not a mom. Or you were a mom. Or because you're a discouraged mom. Again, it's a day that brings a lot of emotions. And if you don't hear anything else from the story of Hannah today, I pray that you hear this. You are more. You are more than just a mom. You are a woman created in the image of God to bear the image of God in this world. You are more. And here's what that means. It means that you are more than the reflection you see in the mirror every morning. You're more. You are more than the number on that tag on your clothes. You are more. Nobody knows what 10 means anyway. 10 of what? I don't know. You are more than the number on that scale when you stand on it. You are more. Not more than that number. You are. <laughs> that went well. You're more than whether or not you've chosen to work outside of the home or not. You're more than whether or not you homeschool or private school or public school your kids. You are more than the sum of the good and bad decisions that your children have made. You are more than the good and bad decisions that you have made as a mom. You're more. And the reason you're more is because as a Christian, your story is more than just a series of random events. It's the story of a God that in your sin rescued and redeemed you by taking all of your mistakes, all of your failures, and even all of your successes upon himself, bore them as his weight on the cross, died for them to redeem them, that you could be called the righteousness of God, that you could be a child of God, a daughter of the king. That's what makes you more. And so whatever day you feel like you're getting it all done and you're, you're just at the top of your game as a mom and everybody's good and everybody's happy and you're winning all the way around or a day that you feel like nothing's going right and you haven't made a good decision and who knows when and you can't handle it anymore or anywhere in between, just remember this, you are more, not because you're having a good or bad day as a mom, but because in Christ Jesus, God loves, has saved and redeems you and calls you his own. You are more. And ladies, my prayer is that as a church, the, the women and the moms in our church would find it within yourself every chance you get. Not to be that woman or that mom who's critical of how somebody else is doing it different than you, but every opportunity you have, you'll be an encourager in Christ Jesus to stir up what is good and lovely in the ladies and women and moms in our church. You are more. So this morning, I wanna close and a final time of prayer, but I would like to pray over our moms. Because the Bible does say we are to honor you. Notice I didn't preach Proverbs 31 today. Aren't you glad? That passage of scripture that every woman feels like this is impossible, and it is. But there's a phrase in Proverbs 31 that I don't want us to miss, and I pray that you don't miss. There's a phrase that says, her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband as well loves her and blesses her. And so moms in the room, if you feel comfortable doing so, I wanna invite you to stand and I wanna pray a prayer of blessing over you and thank you for the gift that you are to all of us.
And for everybody seated, just find a, if you're willing to find a lady near you and just pray for them as I pray aloud. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the truth that in your son, Jesus Christ, we are more than just flawed people. We have been saved and redeemed and our life is made much because of you. I thank you for the ladies in this room, the mothers in this room, God, that you have called and given that blessing to. Encourage them, strengthen them today. Let them know that they are loved, appreciated, and valued. God, give them wisdom to direct and to guide. Give them compassion to listen and to comfort. Give them strength to see another day through, even when they're tired. But God, more than anything, remind them today that they are more than just a mom. They are your daughter. That you loved enough to redeem through the life of your son. You've called them your own. And so God, we honor our moms. We thank you for them. And we thank you for the story of Hannah. And that it's not just a story for moms, but a story for all of us. I pray that we take her example and learn from it to live and be the men and women and children and students that you have called us to be in this world for you and for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everybody said, amen. Happy Mother's Day, moms.